Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is James Otteson, executive director and teaching professor in the School of Business at Wake Forest University and research professor in the Department of Philosophy and in the Center for the Philosophy of Freedom at the University of Arizona. Your latest book is The End of Socialism. It's a fairly comprehensive refutation of socialism. Maybe we can start with just having you tell us what socialism is. The socialism, you're right, that's probably the, the place to start is defining the term. Socialism, um, that word means different things to different people, as does capitalism. Um, but the way I define it, the traditional definition of socialism is the public ownership of the means of production. Um, but what I argue in the book is that that's not so much, um, that's not so appropriate anymore in the age of, in the digital age, the way uh, production has been transferred. When that definition of the, the public ownership of the means of production, um, when that definition was used, that's a time when, um, when the means of production were basically just two things, land and factories. But now we have production that's, being, that's uh, being engaged in in so many different ways that were unimaginable in the 19th century when that phrase was used. That um, What I prefer instead is to think about what I call socialist-inclined policy and capitalist-inclined policy. And the difference is really um, comes down to who's making the decisions. So what I call socialist-inclined policy is policy that um, is motivated to serve certain kinds of moral ends, principally fairness, equality, and community. Um, but the means they use or that, that are proposed to use to achieve those ends are typically asking some group of centralized um, experts or authorities to make decisions about how to allocate resources in the service of those ends. So what that enables me to do is, is to say that um, on the other end of the spectrum, that's a, spe- a continuum, uh, of course, you can have a more, relatively more, relatively uh, fewer decisions made centrally. Um, but then on the other side of it, what, I, what um, we could call capitalist-inclined policy is policy that, that tends to favor, at least at the margins, having decentralized decision-making. So letting individuals or private groups uh, make decisions about how to allocate their resources decentrally um, and privately. So the, de- the, the definition of socialism um, that I use is um, in- that it envisions using centralized mechanisms to try to achieve um, a proper allocation of resources and holdings in the service of its moral ends. So would that make policies like um, Ob- Obamacare, for example, to take, I guess, the biggest uh, – State increase in the last five years or so would that be socialist or socialist inclined on that scale? Yeah, uh, yes. I, I, I wouldn't. I, you know, I'd hesitate to call it socialist. And you know, people argue about whether President Obama himself is a socialist or not. And if by that you mean is he a devotee expressly of Marxism or something? I mean, that's that's probably not the case. Um, but Obamacare as a policy, I think, is socialist inclined on that definition, meaning that. What it envisions is is a much greater exp- um, uh, an expansion, a much greater expansion of the range of decisions regarding healthcare um, that will be made um, either directly made or indirectly made by um, policy or regulatory limitations, um, but effectuated by centralized experts. So, on that criterion, yeah, it would be socialist inclined. Are you distinguishing then socialism from corporatism? Uh, Oh, that's a good question. So, um, and again, corporatism is another word that uh, people have many different definitions about. But um, if we think of if what we mean by corporatism um, is something like cronyism, where you have um, at least nominally privately owned firms, um, but they are either protected by or are seeking subsidies, regulations, etc., through the government to protect their market or protect their industry um, or to subsidize losses or to... Uh, or, uh, to pay for losses or subsidize um, particular lines of research or investigation or whatever, um, then that would also count, at least on my criterion, as socialist inclined policy in the sense that it's, it's not allowing um, decentralized decisions to be made and then people to bear the consequences, good or bad, of those decisions themselves. Now, in your book, uh, which, is, which is very good, it's a very good short uh, a lot of information there if, if people hadn't heard these arguments before. So I commend it to our listeners. And you make two general arguments against socialism. 
kind of almost split down the middle. One of them is the feasibility argument, the practical argument, and one of them is the principled argument. Um, now, the first question is, does it really matter as a, as a moral question whether or not socialism is feasible? I mean, we, we prohibit murder, for example, and we think murder should not be a thing, but we probably can't eradicate murder. So if you can't, even if you can't instill socialism, does it really matter to, uh, to the question of whether or not we should strive for it? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, it's a more deeply philosophical question. And I think you can even use um, other more uh, plausible examples. Um, many moral ideals are difficult or maybe impossible to instantiate or fully realize in, in our lives. Um, I mean, that, that's true for everything from Kant's categorical imperative to you know, people who, uh, I don't know if you remember a decade or so or maybe more uh, ago when people were wearing bracelets that said WWJD. Do you remember that? What yeah. would Jesus do? Yeah, what would Jesus do, yes. What would Jesus do? Okay, well, you know, if you're a Christian and you believe that Jesus is is God, well, then um, then part of your belief is that whatever would Jesus, you're not going to actually be able to do all the things that Jesus was able to do. So, uh, unless you're God yourself, so um, so many moral ideals are have built into them the idea that we won't ever fully or perfectly be able to realize them, but that doesn't necessarily defeat them as an ideal. So, your point's well taken. Um, so, the, but the the strategy of my book is to say because many people think, as you know, many people think and claim that, uh, well, socialism in itself and its moral ideals is morally superior to capitalism, but maybe it's um, it's difficult to realize, and, th- and that could be owing to failures that we have or ver- or institutional or personal failures. So, um, the first part of my book that addresses the feasibility, the reason for that is to say, well, if we're going to endorse a moral ideal. And if that ideal is going to involve various kinds of difficulties or challenges or costs in practice, then um, before we come to the, um, the decision that we should endorse the ideal anyway, we have to have a, a, a pretty good sense of what those challenges and costs are. And so the first part of the book is to explore what, the, what actually are the difficulties, the feasibility difficulties with socialism. Where do they come from and what kinds of costs do they, do they issue in? And my argument in the book is that those costs and difficulties are much greater than many proponents of socialism or socialist inclined policy uh, tend to think. They are they are they're fairly substantial. And the 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 historical fact that most communities, maybe all communities, maybe not quite all, but most communities that have tried to organize themselves around quasi socialist principles haven't been able to succeed, or at least not been able to su- succeed in the long term. And that's not an accident. It's because the costs really are quite substantial. The challenges are very great. So if we want to say, well, but the moral ideal is worth it anyway, we need to know what the anyway is. And so uh, my argument is that you have to, um, if, if you're going to have, a, if you're going to make a recommendation about um, any system of political economy, capitalism, socialism, corporatism, anything else, you have to know what the challenges and costs really are. And, that, and, and only then are you in a good position to, or, to have the argument or have the discussion about whether we should have it anyway. How fatal to the cause of socialism is this question of feasibility? Because even if the costs of, say, getting to the socialist utopia are very high or the, you know, the, the difficulty in getting there, the, the problems that we have to solve are very high, couldn't we still say it's, it's going to be worth it in the same way that you know, a socialist might say, look, you know, that you – you free market people say that we look at look at all the wonderful effects of large scale free markets today, but in order to get there, you had to push through, say, the industrial revolution with all of its, you know, bad stuff. It was it was very damaging to a lot of people, and a lot of people were not necessarily immediately better off. But you wouldn't say, well, we shouldn't have tried to get to wide-scale free markets or capitalism because of the hardships of the Industrial Revolution. Couldn't we say the same thing about socialism? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a good point. And, um, and I'm, I am willing, I mean, unlike maybe some other uh, people who are critics of socialism, I'm willing to concede that argument to the socialists and say, yeah, let's, um, let's not let that um, take that as by itself the definitive refutation of socialism. So let's just, um, w- once we have a, um, a, a pretty clear sense of the Costs and challenges involved, which are very substantial, um, but maybe they're worth making um, in the service of moral ends that we're willing the, that we think are um, the ones we should have as guiding our policy. So I'm willing to concede that that argument. Um, I mean, there is still the practical 
um, issue that sometimes is glossed over that you know the industrial revolution had its uh, its horrors and nightmares um, but it turns out that it um, that for a lot of people their lives started getting better fairly quickly um, life expectancies even in the 19th century started going up pretty dramatically um, and you know if your life expectancy is going up that means a lot of things a lot of good things are happening for you to live a long life you have to have a lot of things go well for you which includes things like nutrition and clean water, maybe health care, education, things like that. Um, so I, I'm willing to concede, at least uh, for the sake of argument, that, um, that sometimes sacrifice is involved um, or is necessary um, during the growing pains of trying to adapt um, uh, to a new set of institutions. So I'm willing to allow that. Um, they, but, but that then brings up um, the central question, which is the second half of my book, which is, well, what are the moral values that um, we think or that we're proposing um, all of these sacrifices and costs and difficulties, um, what are these moral values and do they actually justify it? Um, and on that score, I, I don't think that, I mean, the, 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 social va- the, the moral values that socialism proposes, which are principally equality, fairness, and community, um, those are, I think those are moral values. I, um, I endorse them or at least a, a version of them. Um, But the particular instantiation that you get of those moral values under socialist inclined policy, I think, turns out not to be so attractive as you might have thought, um, especially if you just stuck at the level – you stayed at the level of generality of – Equality, fairness, and community. So, but before we get to the moral stuff, uh, let's let's uh, deal give a little bit deeper into some of the practical uh, problems that socialists and socialist inclined policies face. So, uh, early in the book, you discuss the problem of knowledge and planning. Uh, wh- what is that problem? Well, this is this is not uh, this cluster of problems is not new to me. Of course, um, Hayek talked about this. Mises, many other people had talked about it. Um, But um, what hasn't been appreciated by a lot of moral philosophers, political philosophers, and political economists is the extent of the problem with with knowledge. And what I mean by that is um, the kinds of things that would actually count as being um, helpful to a person. So if somebody needs help, um, what that person needs or requires for help is very difficult to determine and almost impossible to determine from afar. You, You have to know an awful lot about a person's particular circumstances the opportunities available to that person, the person's schedule of values and preferences and hierarchy of purpose, all of those things um, have to be known to, before we can know whether helping the person or what we think would help the person would actually help a person. Um, and what that means is that um, centralized authorities, however expert they might be in general, um, are uh, face a very steep challenge in trying to determine what kinds of reallocations or regulatory um, limitations would actually constitute helping other people. How big of a problem is that? I mean in a lot of cases the the kinds of things where we you know people look to the government and say they ought to we ought to help these people are things that seem I mean kind of obvious like the people don't have enough food to eat or they don't have a home or they don't have enough money to support themselves or they're not educated enough to get a high paying or even decently paying job and those sorts of things seem not, I mean, you don't need to know a lot about the person's value system to say, well, okay, let's let's give the guy food, or let's give the guy money, or let's give him a house, or let's allow him to get an education. Yeah, no, I agree. Although I will, I'll just note that even at the level of the particular things you're talking about, uh, food, education, housing, um, that's still at a at still at the thirty thousand foot level. Um, what we don't, what we haven't yet um, determined or talked about is what this particular person needs with respect to housing. And it's not always going to be the same sort of thing or food. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, so suppose the mayor of your city decides, uh, is worried about obesity and decides that, uh, well, um, drinking too big of, um, of sodas is causing it. It sounds so like wants- a really, really extreme hypothetical yeah. here. I don't know if this is, this is realistic at all. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's uh, very far-fetched, yeah. Um, but suppose he decides to ban sodas over 16 ounces. You can't get a, a soda over 16 ounce, ounces. Um, well, now we can concede that um, obesity is rising in incidence. There are more and more people becoming obese. We can, I mean, that's just a fact. We can concede that, um, that, um, that it has all sorts of other kinds of health-related uh, problems that that can cause. Um, but here's what we, what we can't know. What we can't know is whether any individual person, whether you would be um, be, be made better off or worse off if there's a ban on sodas over 16 ounces. 
And the reason we can't know that is because we don't know what the right amount of soda for you is. Um, we don't know how much soda you should have, you shouldn't have, what all the other things are, are that are going on in your life that, are, that affect your health in various ways. We can't know that. And, um, and that's not even um, addressing the issues of opportunity cost. So, I mean, if you suppose that, um, you know, that suppose in my community, uh, uh, people are on average 20 pounds overweight. Um, and so we think that uh, the soda ban will address that. Well, the most we can show is that the soda ban could conceivably address that. Um, what we can't show is that it um, would probably address it. So there's a big difference between possibility and probability. And what we end up doing, we, we know that there would be costs involved. So there would be costs involved to um, delis. They'd have to retrofit their soda machines or change the way they, uh, the way they um, give soda to customers. Maybe some customers will decide to go to other places. They'll change their mind about where they go. So people will, will react dynamically to these kinds of changes. We can't know the ways in which they'll react. So what we're doing is we're trading certain costs. We know there will be costs, um, but in the favor of completely uncertain benefits. We don't know whether it will actually benefit even a single person because if it's the case that 20% of, or that uh, people in your community are on average 20 pounds overweight, it might be the case that there isn't any single person who's 20 pounds overweight. Um, you could have a lot of people who are underweight and a few who are massively overweight. I mean, that's the problem with, um, with averages like that. We, we don't know anything about any of the particular people. So um, when I say that the problem is a problem of knowledge, what it is is individualized and localized knowledge. We just can't possess that. Um, and that also applies, I think, to, um, to very general programs about food and housing. I mean, if you look at the federal government's programs on food and housing, it would be ha- you'd be hard-pressed to say, well, we're doing some good in there, aren't we? <laughs> Well, it's not clear that we are, and part of the reason that um, that we aren't, I mean, we don't have to assume bad faith on anybody's part. We're just assuming that the people who are distributing these benefits don't really know whether these things are um, will actually and, in fact, benefit their uh, the intended recipients. And that's a, a, another great little turn of phrase, which I had never thought of this analogy, uh, which you can bring up with the Smith's three points, Adam Smith's three points on this, the herding cats problem, which I thought was a great way of an- analogizing what it means to try and plan these things. Uh, and Adam Smith actually did a pretty good amount of work. It was before Hayek, he talked about these problems of local knowledge and what you call the economizer argument and the invisible hand argument. Can you elaborate a little bit more on those? Sure, yeah. Um, a lot of that, we, you know, we, today we credit to uh, people like Hayek, but uh, Smith had an awful lot of that right, right at the beginning. So um, you know, Smith's general argument in favor of, a, um, of a, by our standards anyway, a pretty limited government, a government limited to protecting what he called justice, which was just um, protecting um, persons so from, from theft, uh, sorry, from assault, from killing, from uh, slavery. So protecting your person, protecting your property, um, also against fraud, and then protecting voluntary contracts. So Smith's government was essentially that. Now, he was willing to allow for there to be some potential public works as well. And you, you, have, you quote a great line I had never heard from his, like in, in Smith society, you could be just by – something like sitting, sitting in a chair and doing nothing or something along right. those lines. Right. He says we can uh, fulfill the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. <laughs> um, and what he means by that is if you're sitting still and doing nothing, then you're not uh, killing, assaulting or defrauding anybody, which uh, – and for him, it, it, it's a thin conception of justice, but that's fulfilling the rules of justice. Um, but um, yeah, so – a lot of the arguments, so the, the, the more general argument that he gives in favor of that conception of a limited government uh, relies on those arguments you, just mentioned, you mentioned just a minute ago, the local knowledge argument, which we've been talking about, um, the economizer argument, and the invisible hand argument. The economizer argument is just a sort of claim about human nature. We, we tend to want to get um, the most we can out of the energies we invest in anything. So a less charitable way of putting that is that we're lazy, uh, <laughs> but... More charitable ways that we're economizers. We we don't we, we tend not to want to invest any more energy than we have to to achieve whatever our goals are. Um, and if you accept both of those, so the the local knowledge argument, meaning that uh, our knowledge is limited um, to the kinds of things we actually ourselves experience and know about, um, the economizer argument that we tend to want to economize on our energies. And the third part is that invisible hand argument that um, if you have a set of institutions that allows people to. Um, to strive to better their own condition, what they'll do is they will find ways to better their own condition that inadvertently or unwittingly or as if by an invisible hand also benefit other people. Um, so um, it's an ingenious argument, but a lot of it is, um, is, was given uh, a much more sophisticated and technical apparatus by later thinkers, including Hayek. Right around that part of the book, you uh, bring up the 
luck egalitarian argument, which uh, which is interesting. It sort of fits into this entire thing of what you know about people and how much you can plan this stuff out. Uh, can you explain exactly what that is? We actually had Elizabeth Anderson on the podcast a, a while back, back so uh, uh, some of our listeners may be familiar. What the luck egalitarian argument and why you think that's also infeasible from this knowledge and planning standpoint? Yeah, it's a, it's another argument that that I think um, is uh, has the right in, or has good intentions and sounds good in the abstract, but when you start to translate it into practice, it runs into all sorts of difficulties. So the the general claim is that um, there is an element of luck in everybody's lives. So we have good luck and we have bad luck, and some people um, seem to ha- have some element of uh, of the success they achieve in life is due to factors outside of themselves. So they just got lucky. And on the other side, there are people who um, who haven't done as well in life, and at least part of that is due to um, ba- receiving bad luck. So the lucky egalitarian argument is that, well, um, even if we are willing to say that people should enjoy the benefits or suffer the consequences of choices they themselves make, um, what about all the things that affect their lives that had not- that they had nothing to do with? Um, and might we not be justified in transferring some of the portion of the success of people who um, were successful, who achieved success because of things outside of their control, good luck, and transferring some of that, um, some of the, that success in terms of redistribution of wealth to people who um, whose relatively lower levels of success were due to factors outside of their control as well. Um, and so the, the argument I make is that um, that uh, it's certainly true. I mean, it just con- it's effectively to concede an awful lot of that. It's it's certainly true that luck plays a role in everybody's life, good and bad luck. There's no life that's been only good luck. There's no life that's been only bad luck. But um, everybody ha- has had luck. Um, the the problem comes in when we see somebody who who is who appears to us to need help. What we don't know is exactly what role luck played in any of that in any of that particular person's life. So we can say in general, it might be, um, there might be good reasons to support redistributing wealth from, um, from relatively lucky, successful people to relatively unlucky, unsuccessful people. Um, but the devil is, is always in the details. Um, how do we know who actually was lucky and who wasn't? How do we know what proportion of any person's success or failure was due to factors outside of their control? It's very difficult to know that from afar. It's very difficult to know that about people that you know intimately. So even your best friends or your siblings or your family. Um, you may have um, much more knowledge of their situation, um, but you don't know and nobody knows exactly what role luck um, or p- good or bad played. But don't we know that I mean, one of the, the biggest factors contributing to different outcomes in terms of wealth or educational attainment or whatever else we would care to measure when we're talking about, say, inequality, that one of the biggest factors is – the accident or luck of birth, right? Like that, you know, if you're born into a top income bracket, your chances of staying in that bracket or remaining in that bracket are much higher than if you were born into a lower one. People don't tend to move around a huge amount. And that, I mean, if there's if there's anything that we can kind of comfortably say is luck and not based on your own merits or your own choices, it's who you were born to and where you were born and how much money they happen to have. So couldn't we at least see redistribution or socialism as justified in trying to correct that? I mean, isn't that of part work? of what the public school system is about to some extent, trying to equalize, you know, by yeah, getting so them out of the family? Is that isn't that a good idea? Um, a good idea in 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 idea, yes, um, or at least uh, arguably yes. In practice, it's much more difficult, and I think the public school system is a is a great case uh, to look at. Public schools, um, there are a lot of really horrific public schools, and where do the horrific public schools um, tend to exist? They exist in exactly the the communities that we're trying to help. Um, the good public schools exist in the kinds of communities that we think don't need the help. Um, and so, so it's not clear that public schools is. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking very, very broadly, of course, but it's not clear that we're actually achieving the kind of help that we would like to achieve. Um, but th- that's that's not uh, refuting in any way the point about um, the accident of birth and the luck of being of getting good parents or being um, in a good school district or um, um, get happen- happening to get good genes in one way or another from your parents. All that seems to be pure luck, and and um, and I uh, I think it's unarguable that um, that people can't claim personal responsibility. I can't claim responsibility for who my parents were, or um, or what school district I went to. 
Um, now, um, we, we all have heard stories about people, and these are true stories, about people who rose out of not very pleasant sounding circumstances and did very well. And on the contrary, people who had everything for, going for them, had all the privileges and advantages you could imagine, and then ended up having not, not very um, especially successful lives. So what does that show? Well, it just shows that it's very difficult to talk about these things in general. So um, the, 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 the abstract in, um, view or the abstract impulse that, well, some people need help. I think that's true. And, um, and to the degree that the socialist impulse or the socialist instinct is addressing that, then I, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm 100% behind it. Um, but as a political economist, um, we can't just rely at the level of abstractions or, or generalities or aggregate statistics. We have to look at how the kinds of policies we're capable of actually implementing, what effects do they actually have? And philosophers tend not to either want to talk about that or they, 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 for whatever reason, they don't talk about those things. But I think if we're talking about actually implementing a system of political economy or a system of policies that will affect real human lives, live human beings, um, then we have to ask that question. We have to ask what are the actual effects, not what are the intended or hoped for or aspirational effects of policy, but what are the actual effects? And there we have quite a bit of empirical evidence to look at. And um, I think uh, on balance, it's very difficult to argue that centralized attempts to uh, relieve misery um, or to um, or heighten people's chances of success, it's very difficult to argue that we've been uh, very good at that, despite enormous resources being put to, the, um, to those causes and despite very earnest and well-meaning people at the heads of them. It's just extremely difficult. And I think the argument, I mean, the, the reason for it is because we just don't have the particularized, localized knowledge that we would need to know what any individual person, even what any individual community really needs. You mentioned that we need to look at the actual world and the actual effects and that reminds me of something that we've discussed in past episodes of this podcast a handful of times which is the idea of comparing real to real or ideal to ideal and the mistake of – often comes up of comparing you know, one ideal version of a theory to the real world version of a competing theory. Right. And, and so you've told this story so far about you know, that there's these problems of knowledge and that local knowledge is, is good and leads to better decision making, that the invisible hand will people acting in their own interest or for their own purposes will have these positive externalities for the rest of us. But we also know, I mean, we, you know, behavioral economics has become kind of popular lately and one of the things that it appears to have shown us is that people are in their everyday decisions and their economic decisions often rather irrational. People make bad choices all the time. The market can lead to odd or suboptimal outcomes and so even – you know, it, capitalism, free markets aren't perfect even with these these stories of how they might work better. So wouldn't it – I mean even with the problems of socialism, at least in that case, we might have really smart people, the people who lucked out in terms of the education that they were able to have, making decisions that might even with all these other problems still be better than the ones that some people make for themselves? Uh, they might be. I mean that's certainly true. Um, but if, even in cases like those, it's still – I mean I still think that we, we – our tendency is to underestimate um, just how complex and, uh, and difficult – how complex human beings are and how difficult it is to affect or change human behavior, especially across a country of a 330 million people um, in the directions we want. Um, so let me give you a, a, an example from development economics. So the UN Millennium Project, um, which is this idea that we're going to – solve poverty in developing countries um, if we have enough resources and if we have the right comprehensive plan uh, to deploy those resources in the right way. Um, well, it has 449 different uh, iterations. So there are 449 different variables that their plan recognizes. Now, if you start thinking about that, well, um, what's the probability that each of those – so for the whole plan to work, all of those variables have to go in the right direction. Um, and by the way, each the 449 is already um, uh, as big a number as that sounds. That's actually a small uh, that that's underestimates the total because each of those has various components and subcomponents as well. Can you give an example of what those variables might look like? 
Yeah, so the variables are things like um, potable water in Kenya um, and, um, and reading materials in Ghana, in a particular part of Ghana. Um, so you have 449 of those, um, things like that. But um, let's just – And these are the things we they, – they believe are needed to help raise the Millennium communities out of poverty, correct? Correct. Right, um, that will get them over the hump, as it were, so that they're no longer developing, but uh, uh, you know, what we call developing economies, but are becoming developed. Um, but if you just think at the say at the level of math for a second, you know, probabilities are are a funny thing. Um, if you have, um, you know, if, if you flip a coin twice, and the coin is fifty percent either heads or tails, um, well, the chance um, that you'll get heads twice, you have to multiply those two probabilities, so it comes out to twenty five percent chance that you'll get heads twice. Um, if you, but if you multiply probabilities, that means if you take 449 iterations, that means that um, your, the chance that the entire thing will work is the sum of the multiplied um, of uh, the multiplied probabilities of each of those iterations. And that's assuming that you were correctly identifying the 449 things. You weren't you weren't exactly. leaving some out. Yes, right. So not 450, not 448. You got the right number and you got the right kind. But even conceding all of that. If, and I'll even make this, the case stronger. Suppose you have a 99% chance that every single one of those 449 will turn out to exactly the way you, you hope or want it to turn out. The probability then with 99% chance multiplied 449 times, what you, the probability that the whole plan will work out is only 1%. Just 1%. So um, the, the vast amount of knowledge and uncertainty and probability that has to somehow be um, achieved in order to have a plan for a society that will um, that will get even these what seem like very good and they are good goals of housing, education, etc. Um, it's just um, orders of magnitude beyond what uh, human beings can actually comprehend. Now, the another great little term you come up with because a lot of these uh, when you bring up. Uh Concepts that I've been familiar with in other contexts, you have really good names for them. So, you have another one called the day two problem, uh, right. which which I'd like if you could explain exactly what that is. Yeah, the day two problem is just that. Um, so, um, if, if we're able to effectuate a distribution of our resources and allocation of holdings um, in the way that we want to, so putting aside for a second whatever challenges or difficulties there were that led up to that, but if we're finally able to get a distribution of resources that looks like the one we want. We'll give you a magic button. You can just push it okay. and, and make we'll, it. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll wave the magic wand, and everything um, today is exactly the way we think it should be. Whatever that, whatever way that is, if it's exactly equal or whatever distribution it is, um, we have it today. Um, the problem is that immediately, and by day two, as I, I put it, um, things start changing. And the reason for that goes back to the, uh, what you mentioned a minute ago, which is the herding cats problem. Human beings begin behaving in ways that you can't predict. They start trading, exchanging, innovating. Their preferences change. Their preferences change dynamically based on what other people's pre- changes are and other people's preferences. So immediately um, you have a new distribution signature of resources and, um, and, um, and wealth and whatever it was that, that we were uh, distributing the first time around. Which means we're faced with another problem. So on day two, as it were, we have to decide, well, um, are we going to let things just continue on in the way that um, they would with letting people continue to make decentralized, localized decisions about how to uh, spend their time, talent, and treasure? Um, or do we need to have another redistribution? Um, and what you typically see is that people say, no, 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 we have to, we have to do it all over again. Um, and this, um, faces, th- this is now faced with two more difficulties. One um, you're going to have to start restricting people's behaviors um, in lots of ways, including in uh, many cases in ways that we would think would conflict with people's um, uh, individual rights, their rights to their property, their rights to liberty, etc. Um, but there's also a, a, um, a resources uh, cost, and that is that um, you're now dedicating, you're now getting a, a large and increasing um, number of people whose job it is to get information about what the new uh, distribution looks like. Um, they're gathering, uh, there's a, m- a mechanism for taking resources from one place and then another mechanism to distribute it to another. Uh, you're monitoring people's behavior. Um, and these, th- this itself causes an enormous amount of um, cost. It's usually seen as opportunity cost. So these people could have been engaging in other productive activity. They're not doing that now. 
And you also have the problem that um, we shouldn't discount, which is that at the margins, um, people's incentive to um, continue producing things and changing, exchanging, uh, cooperating um, as they would like, um, their incentive to do so decreases ever so slightly. So at each iteration, so the day two problem means you're faced with again having to make yet another distribution. Um, and there's a good chance that either you'll have less to redistribute the second time or at least that the rate of growth won't be as high as it otherwise would have been. So, and you mean less to distribute uh, because of the combination of A, the administrative overhead and leakage and B, the, the diminished productive capacity because the incentives have changed. Right. Mo- exactly. Mostly. Exactly. Um, and um, and then, so each iteration you have – so the day two problem, I mean I, that, that phrase is a metaphor. It doesn't have to be a day. It could be a week or a month or a year. <clears throat> but even if you ex- extend out the time, um, the longer time you have between these iterations, the more difficult it becomes because the actual, um, the actual signature of, of resources and innovation and cooperation in society – changes dynamically and continuously. So it's going to get further and further away from whatever your plan was on day one. So the longer you wait, the more difficulties you'll have. And if you're going to try to reset things again a second time to where you would like them to be, the costs involved are just that much greater. So the day two problem is that you can't, um, is that even if you assume that everything was just, was exactly the way it should be, say morally ought to be on day one, you're faced with exactly the same problem again on day two and then on day three, et cetera. And that, and that problem will never go away. Well, if the problem is that our – basically our tastes and interests as human beings and the way we behave, our propensity to truck and barter leads to upsetting patterned distributions, then – I mean you've given us reasons why trying to fix the day two problem on day three, four and five isn't going to work very well or is going to have – consequences we don't like. But couldn't the alternative be to address the day two problem on say day minus one or day minus two? I'm thinking of you know, like the, the notion of what we need is a socialist man or, or in Plato's Republic, his elaborate system for educating the rulers and making sure that they have precisely the right kinds of interests and the right behaviors to sustain the state, that maybe we don't need to deal with those problems if we can you know, have an educational system that makes it so that people aren't constantly wanting the new thing. You know, don't want to upgrade their iPhone every year, but are content with the one that they've got, and then then we won't have to worry about upsetting patterns. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, and uh, imagine what you would have to do. You know, it, it, so you mentioned Plato's Republic. Um, so you're right. So Plato has a very elaborate system of education that he envisions for for the people who will eventually become the philosopher kings. Um, but there's a, a very substantial trade-off that's involved, um, not just with liberty, but also with uh, prosperity. Um, so all of the people in Plato's Republic, um, with, with uh, n- not even uh, accepting the philosopher kings themselves, who also are, have to be forced to assume their role on his view, um, every one of them is assigned a place in society, um, notwithstanding whatever it is they themselves would like to do. So um, someone is, so the philosopher king determines what the uh, ideal role for every single person and every single class of people in society is in the service of the overall good society that the philosopher king is imagining. Um, so you have a very substantial limitation of liberty. So if effectively no one has the liberty to order their own lives the way they would like. And I think that's um, very deeply inconsistent with any kind of uh, liberal conception of government, certainly the classical liberal um, conception of government that I endorse. Um, but there's also the, uh, the very substantial cost with productivity. Um, you're not going to be getting cooperative innovation. Um, and that's a cost that you, that you have to take. You have to think long and hard about whether that's a trade-off you're worth making. I mean, is it really the case that people don't want the next iPhone, that they don't, and not just iPhones, but the, do they really not want the next, um, the next kind of uh, pharmaceutical drug or medical procedure? Do they not want to, um, to have whatever the innovations would be that would allow people to do research into Alzheimer's or breast cancer, et cetera? I mean, you, what, what you're doing if on the day minus one, as you said, or the day minus two, what you're doing is effectively locking the society in at that stage and not allowing it to evolve or change or progress past that. And, um, you know, a way to think about, and so that's certainly not a society that I would want to live in. And I think most people wouldn't. And, you know, the way to think about it is, 
Um, well, suppose people had decided to do this in, let's say, 1950. Well, um, would you want to live? Would you still want to live in the world? Give up all the things that we've been able to um, creatively and creatively and destructively um, um, generate in a market economy since 1950? That would include um, things like the internet. <laughs> Um, how many people would be willing to give up things like the internet? Um, or but I wouldn't know it, it was going to exist, so I wouldn't be missing anything. So we could just lock us all into 1950. I mean, didn't England in their socialist this planning Cuba, in the right? 50s? Yeah, they, exactly. Cuba, and we all yeah, drive cool, cool cars. cars and, yeah, cool cars. Yeah, go try living in Cuba. So you know, I, mean, <laughs> I want a Netzel. It's okay. I mean, you know, just yeah. a thing. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm being flippant about it, but um, you know, I, I think. I think it's easy for us now. So we live now, we in America today, you and I talking on this or li- anybody who's listening to this podcast, we, you know, we have to remember that we have at our fingertips resources that previous generations couldn't have imagined. So by any historical standard, we are fabulously wealthy. So even those of us who think, well, I'm not in the 99th, I'm not in the 1%, I'm in the, you know, the 2% or the 5%. Historically speaking, we are all in the in the ninety nine point nine ninth percentile of uh, of human history. So it's easy for us to say, "Well, sure, wouldn't it be fine to give up a little bit here at the margins or there at the margins?" But the people who really get um, who feel the bite of that, and because we're we're as wealthy as we are, we perhaps can absorb some of those costs. The people who really feel the bite of that are the people who are lower down on the economic spectrum. They're the ones who really suffer from not having the opportunity to raise themselves up or to um, create more prosperity in their lives. They're the ones who really suffer from it. And I think one of the chief central and and indeed moral goals of political economy is not um, so that we can uh, flatter the moral sensibilities of those of us who are lucky enough to be at the uh, very highest in human history of, uh, of, of human wealth and prosperity, um, but rather we got to focus on what are the effects that that's going to have on the rest of the people and including the bottom billion who are alive today. What's, what effects are those kinds of policies going to have on them? And if we, have, we want to have any kind of chance of enabling them to enjoy, to ascend out of poverty, ascend out of all the miseries of poverty, um, the, the, the centralizing the, the effects, the, the negative unintended consequences of attempting to centralize economies are going to redound especially hard on them. And that, that's actually a good segue into the, in the second part of your book uh, where you say if this wasn't bad enough uh, in terms of instantiating socialism and the intractable problems that present, it presents to anyone trying to do that, it's also immoral. Uh, it also has extreme moral failings and one of the first things you take up in that part of the book is, is redressing the argument that economics itself is amoral. Right. Uh, that economics is the dismal science, or is uh, you, I think you mentioned uh, Robert Skidelsky, uh, who's written all these this book about how much is enough. I think is the name of that book, or something like right. that. It's like you're earning too much money, but but you actually think about growth and what we're you know what we're gaining by having these these this economic wealth. It's very important, right? Um, and I think one of the mistakes, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. One of the mistakes that I think anyway, a lot of people make, yes, they, they view economic reasoning as this sort of cold and lifeless, inhuman uh, calculation of efficiency. Um, but what I think we have to remember is that all of the capital that exists in the world um, that is able to be redistributed or allocated in, in any way whatsoever, 100% of that capital is the result of labor of actual human beings. So it's created by human beings. So um, now how are, they, how are they creating it? Well, they're creating it on the basis of their own schedules of value and the things that matter to them. So um, economic calculation, you know, we think, well, efficiency doesn't seem to qu- quite rise. You know, it doesn't meet moral muster. It doesn't rise to the level of, uh, of concern that a philosopher should give it uh, any attention. Um, but I think that's a mistake because um, – all of all of the, the, that reasoning, all of the capital that we're talking about, was created by human beings. So when we undertake to reallocate it or to change it, what we're really doing is undertaking to reallocate or change human beings. And there, I think you're right square in the middle of a moral conversation. It's interesting, and that's a big part of the second half of the book is is valuing individuals qua individuals, which I which I it's quite clear that you think is one of the most morally important things about capitalism over socialism. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the great moral 
successes of um, the second millennium and then uh, coming into uh, the 19th, 20th, and 21st century and what, uh, is the idea that human beings are unique. And um, because they are every single one of them, not just this class or that class, but even within, you know, we talk about socioeconomic classes, um, but every single member of those classes is a unique center of human moral agency. And because of that, I argue anyway, is special and deserves dignity. It has dignity and deserves our respect as being a dignified moral agent. That's a great uh, moral leap forward, if you'll allow me a phrase like that. It's a great <laughs> leap forward to see people not as groups. So um, not as this race or that race or this ethnicity or that ethnicity or this religion or that religion, but instead as uh, instead seeing them as uh, valuable, indeed precious individuals. And one of the problems, um, I mean, I, I think this connects with the question of equality. So, you know, one of the main moral values that socialism endorses is equality. Um, but it's a different kind of equality than the one uh, from the one that, say, Adam Smith endorsed. So Adam Smith also endorsed a, endorsed a kind of equality. But the equality he was interested in was the equality of moral agency. It was the idea that um, we couldn't, that no single person should mandate to another person how he should live his life. That your life was yours. Um, you are a full, complete moral agent. And as such, you are rightfully the captain of your own journey. And um, it's not the, and if we assume, if I assume that I, that, um, that I can mandate or command you to, behave or exchange or labor in the way that I want as opposed to the way you want, then what I'm, a do- what I'm doing is assuming a moral superiority over you. I'm assuming that, you're, that the scope of your moral agency is narrower than mine. Um, and that, I think, is an extremely problematic conception of, um, of inequality. So the, the, the moral equality that I argue matters is the one that sees human beings as equally precious and equally um, entitled to be the authors of their own lives. I can see that socialists though listening to what you've just said and saying, well, yeah, and that's why I'm a socialist, saying that you know in the in the market systems that you prefer, what ends up happening is people get seen as just a source of labor. Their their inputs into this economic model, they're they're cogs in the machine, they're at the mercy of the bosses, the corporate owners who direct their lives, tell them what they can do, when they have to show up for work, what sorts of medical procedures they're allowed to get, whereas at least in the and, – you know, and the government in a free market system is responsive to that. It kind of it, – its number one job is to look out for property, for profits, for money and make sure that people get to keep that stuff, whereas the, the socialist government says absolutely every person is special, absolutely every person is autonomous and so what we're going to do is put the government entirely at the mercy of the needs of the people. We're going to task it with making sure not that property is protected as the corporations have what they need but that every person has the the food and shelter and resources to – Live that kind of autonomous life to have those choices, not just you know, in theory, but in practice, in a, in a positive right standpoint, in addition to in a negative right standpoint. Well, that may be what they say, but let's look at what they do. Um, I mean, one of the beautiful things about um, about um, the kind of Adam Smithian economy is that um, every single person has the right and authority to say no, thank you, and go elsewhere. So if I don't like the deal you're offering, I can say no thank you and go elsewhere. If I don't like the price, if I don't like the contract you're offering me to work there, I can quit. I can leave. I can go somewhere else. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to get everything I want. That's certainly not the case. But there we're back to this question of the ideal um, versus the practical. No system of political economy can ever guarantee everybody to get uh, whatever they want. That's not possible in a, um, in a community of human beings who are imperfect and have all the various biases and prejudices and limitations on knowledge, et cetera, that we have. So what we have to do is, is compare actually possible alternatives. And what you've seen, in, and when we do that, then I think the, the, the contrast becomes much sharper. Because in those communities in which um, that more robustly try to, um, um, to adopt a, what, I, what I call the socialist inclined set of policies, you often do not get the option to say no, thank you. Um, you will get what you're what you're assigned or allotted, and uh, you'll be happy with it. Um, whereas under under the market economy that I'm talking about, um, you might not get everything you want, but nothing that you um, that you do is is anything that you didn't yourself consent to. Uh, 
you have to say, yes, I'm going to do that. And if you don't want to do it, you don't. And that's um, a really important aspect of moral agency that I think does, I mean, whatever the intentions are behind um, socialist and client policy, um, if I can't say no thanks, so just think about, we mentioned Obamacare before. Um, it is an enormous um, list of restrictions on what people can do. Um, you don't get to get certain kinds of insurance policies. Insurance companies don't get to offer certain kinds of insurance policies. Medical professionals don't get to do certain kinds of services except under pre-approved circumstances, etc. And then the list goes on and on. Now, that's not to say that, you know, maybe would some of those outcomes be good? Would some of them, those outcomes be bad? Sure. And, and it's hard to know in advance exactly what, the, um, you know, what the, the balance will be between good and bad. But what you can know, just from the moral standpoint, what you can know is that you're dramatically reducing, narrowing the scope of individual human beings' agency. But isn't isn't the case that the guy who gets up in the morning uh, goes to you know goes to work at McDonald's or work on the factory floor? Isn't it just kind of a farce to say that this guy has a voluntary choice that he's he's actually he can say no thanks, uh, and that's what makes capitalism respect him because they give him the illusion of being able to say no thanks. Um, well, I mean, what are we comparing this to? Um, are we comparing it to um, – so what is the system of economy we can imagine that actually would work, um, that we've actually seen, where that person would have more freedom than he does? Now, if you say if he had more wealth, could he have more opportunities? That's certainly true. Um, and, but that just brings us back to the question of how do we generate wealth or how do we generate prosperity? On the other hand, um, if that's not what we're talking about, if we're talking about, say, restrictive or coercive employment practices, you know, are there such things? Of course there are. Have there been such things? Yes. But what you see in market-based economies is a fairly um, steady and regular progression away from contracts like that. So we don't have very many people in America, for example. Um, who are trying to raise, thank goodness, who are trying to uh, raise a family or lead their entire lives only working at McDonald's. If you spend time, at, if you start at McDonald's at the minimum wage, or I guess now they're thinking about raising the minimum wage for some people, whatever the wage is, you start there. Um, in six months, you're making a little bit more. Um, and in a year, you're making even more. And so the range of opportunities that are available you, to you and continue to increase. But you know, let's think about the person at McDonald's. The person at McDonald's, if he doesn't like what's going on there, there uh, thankfully, there isn't just um, McDonald's in the world. Um, in America, there are hundreds of thousands of businesses, um, indeed millions of businesses, um, that um, where a person can take his ware somewhere else. So I, th I mean, th this is not going to solve all problems. So it, it's certainly the case for any individual. I mean, I even I, you know, I, I'm a I'm a cushy professor, and you know, be, being a professor is the easiest job in the world. We like to complain about it. <laughs> Um, so, um, but even in, even in a job like this, I often feel like, you know, people are, I'm being forced to do things that I don't want to have to do. I have to, there are aspects of my job that I don't enjoy, but at the margins, I can always say I can, I can, and still retain the right always to say no thanks and go elsewhere. Now, maybe the other options are not ones I would like in an ideal world, but having options never makes a person worse off. It, um, having options makes a person better off. And that's a, in terms of respect there. Uh, one of the lines you have, respect for the individual in those situations, which I think has been a huge part of the debate in the social the socialist thought since the time of Marx was sort of taking individuals and thinking of them, especially on the lower part of the society, as lesser quality people in a weird way, not being able to make the same kind of choices that upper quality people can make and trying to rectify that through top-down government policies, which is kind of paternalistic. You write, uh, the institutions of capitalism do not second-guess the decisions you make and they do not presume to know better than you what the right decisions are for you and what decisions you would have made had circumstances around you been different, which I think is a, a very important point. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think there is an element, and we can, you know, assume uh, again. I, you know, I, I want to assume good faith on the part of everybody who's um, joining this debate. You know, we assume that the intentions are good. Some people have less in the world than other people, and some people have so much less that um, they're, you know, they're in difficult circumstances. So the question is not whether um, that's good or bad. It's where it, it's what kinds of institutions um, will actually benefit those people. Um, and you know, this is part of the. The knowledge problem we talked about before, it's very difficult to know. Um, but what you, what you can get in, in a market economy is um, the, the freedom to tailor your life under the circumstances and constraints that you find yourself in uh, 
um, you can tailor your life to your own lights, to your own, um, so that you, uh, to use the metaphor I used before, you become the captain of the, your own journey. I mean, I think one of the mistakes we often make is to think that, you know, this, there's this um, sort of metaphor that life is a race. Um, and, you know, and some people are better equipped for the race when they start, um, you know, at, um, I mean, I, I sometimes say to my students, well, um, I think, suppose that the grade you get at the end of class is going to be determined um, by a race we're going to run right now. We're all going to go out and run a mile. And you have to go right now dressed exactly as you are um, and with, with whatever preparation or lack of preparation you have. We're going to go race and that's going to determine the grades in the class. Um, well, everybody would complain about that. Um, I mean, they do, um, especially if, I, if I'm able to get them to, con- to think that I'm actually considering that. <laughs> they, they nearly revolt. Um, but I think that's exactly the wrong metaphor to, think, um, to use when thinking about life. Life is not a race. Um, and it, Your life is a journey, and it's a journey of exploration and discovery to find out what really is the kind of life that, as Aristotle said, will lead to eudaimonia or true human uh, flourishing and happiness. That is not going to be the same kind of life for every person. In fact, I would say that it's going to be uniquely, um, su- um, uniquely indexed to each individual person. So if we start thinking about life like that, then, we're, then, um, then the policy implication is that we should stop um, considering that we have to have policies, um, regula- regulations, redistribution, etc., that will give things to people. Um, instead, what, what it will do is uh, allow people to create the kind of life that they would think is worth living. So it's, a, it's about creating opportunities for people um, rather than treating them as patients um, in a hospital that we have to keep healthy or something. Isn't in our, our present political climate, our, our present debate, socialism as something people are actually striving for, an actual political ideal that we're aiming at? Kind of off the table. I mean, you don't you don't hear a lot of people going around today shouting "Workers of the World Unite." The markets seem to have won out in most people's minds. So why write a book against socialism now? Uh, it's a good it's a good question. Um, you don't hear many people saying "Workers of the World Unite." You're right. Um, on the other hand, you do still hear that. I mean, you remember the Occupy movement in New York? It wasn't that long ago that uh, the uh, and, uh, the Occupy movement took place. I mean, uh, you, you remember that, and there were people who were saying things like that. Um, but fair enough. I, I, I think um, very few people today call themselves or consider themselves socialists. Um, and by uh, and by the same token, very few people will call themselves capitalists either, because that term has all sorts of negative connotations as well. Um, so those two terms as terms, I think you're right. Um, maybe, the, maybe the time has passed for the terms, although um, moral philosophers still use those terms. Um, but I think what is still relevant today is um, the, the continuum between, on the one hand, wanting more and more of the economic decisions in a community, in a country, to be made centrally as opposed to um, decentrally. And uh, that uh, brings us back right to where we started in, um, in our discussion I think the key, um, the key practical difference between what I call socialist inclined policy and capitalist inclined policy is this um, degree is this question of who's making the decisions. Are we allowing individuals to make them um, for themselves in their own cases, or are we marginally and maybe um, progressively limiting the decisions people can make on the basis of centralized uh, judgments about uh, value or about um, um, the kinds of behaviors people ought to engage in? And that is a very live debate, and I think that actually, in some in some ways, um, captures very much of the current political day. Um, do we see um, these in- individuals as being capable and competent of leading their own lives um, if they're allowed the opportunity and the responsibility to do so, um, or do we think that um, we need to help them along and uh, maybe progressively help them in more and more ways? And I think that, in, in some ways, is the crux of the current political economic debate, and uh, that's what my book is uh, attempting to address. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. <laughs>